Bien, alors, euh, merci d'être là. So, thank you for being here. Uh, we're now going to continue with our seminars on material science, uh, from materials encountered by chance to uh, made to measure materials, this evolution of materials that uh, embodies technological innovation. One of the reasons for innovation is to changing what we require from materials. And one of the major questions of the last decade is the environmental impact, not only of materials, but of industrial products, which is why I thought it would be important to have a seminar and a lecture, not about eco-design itself, but at least an introduction about the issues posed in industrial product design uh, that is uh, friendly, environmental, environmentally friendly. And then uh, when you see everything that's being said about it, uh, perhaps I thought uh, medieval theology might be easier to do as a lecture. I'm going to try and show you a rational approach of the environmental impacts in the design of products. And you will see that there are a certain number of paradoxes meaning that uh, good intentions are not necessarily good ideas. I'm going to try and tell you about how these environmental impacts are taken into account in materials development. Then we shall be discussing an example which is crucial, which is the construction industry. So why construction industry? It's around one-third of our use of energy as a whole. It's something which potentially uh, can pollute a lot or almost not at all. And it's something also that cannot be offshored. I don't think that houses uh, anytime soon will be built on the other side of the world to be built here. So um, a lot of reasons to take an interest in this particular sector. And uh, Bernard Iriex from EDF um, in the following seminar will be discussing this. And then this afternoon we shall be uh, discussing a very particular uh, part of the construction industry, which is the insulation of buildings. So it's going to be quite a tough day today, and this afternoon will be uh, uh, full of interesting things, and it reflects the importance of the subject as a whole. And in the next lecture, we shall be discussing what I'm telling you that we're asking our materials to change. In fact, next week we're really going to be asking materials everything. We're going to be asking them to work in a uh, extreme conditions uh, where uh, things are so complex uh, that uh, uh, they become very difficult. And the workshop next week will be even more complex because it will be about what we do not understand in terms of engineering on a few specific topics. Uh, that will be the penultimate lecture. And the final lecture will be dedicated to what can be um, found and drawn from natural solutions. So let's go back to today's program. The ideas I'm going to be discussing today are ideas which have emerged from collaboration over time with Farouk Tejar. Some of you may have heard his name um, as part of uh, Jean-Louis Tarascon's chair about energy storage, meaning that if you want to see more specific things about envir the environmental impact of materials in batteries, for instance, uh, the recycling of rare materials, you can uh, refer to last year's lectures uh, by Jean-Marie Tarascon. So let's look at our guiding thread. We are moving increasingly towards the concept of uh, made-to-measure materials. Just a couple of words um, for you to to see things clearly. When I'm talking about sustainable development and eco-design, uh, in sustainable development there is development. Um, my approach is far from Malthusian. What I'm trying to show is not how you can reduce development, but how you can have development um, with um, the environment in mind, how the use of materials can be optimized. So let's have a look at the menu a little bit, like what we did in the choice of materials in terms of materials, emissions, and environmental impact. 
Let's have a look in terms of the production of materials. Um, there are various categories, various classes of materials. The uh, first bars are those with inorganic materials, polymers, and then you have materials that are more uh, similar to natural or solid materials, uh, cement, concrete, asphalt, glass, natural fibers, and so on. This is in terms of productions in tons per year. Uh, strangely enough, paper is not in here because uh, uh, the production of paper in the world is actually quite huge. So if you look at the first class of materials, you see uh, oil and coal, which clearly are the winners, and then you have steel and then aluminium alloys, um, all of that far above the rest of the metals. If you look at the polymers, you have pretty much the same thing. If you look at concrete, it's the global winner. So if you're really wondering about environmental impact, I think you really seriously need to examine what can be done with concrete in terms of both their production and their use. Um, it's not entirely uh, decorrelated, of course, um, um, with the fact that I thought the construction would be interesting to examine. So if you look at this type of diagram, the annual production of the various classes of materials. If you look more closely at the uh, breakdown, you will note that around 96% of uh, the tonnage of materials is implemented for a limited number of materials, basically. If you look at the number of tons, which is, in a sense, which in a sense reflects environmental impact, the amount of energy required to produce them, you want to see that if you really want to have an impact, you need to be working on dominant classes of materials such as steel or concrete. I'm sure you've heard a lot in the news with Florange about the Alcos project. The Alcos project consisted, and still does, in reducing CO2 emissions per tonne of steel. I don't usually comment current affairs, but I think there are a few interesting uh, facts to be drawn from that. Um, it's not by um, greenwashing uh, blast furnaces that the problems are going to be solved. Uh, but the Elcos project wanted to re aims to reduce uh, emissions of CO2 per tonne of steel. And in 15 years, they've been uh, cut by half because um, blast furnaces have been made more efficient. What I'm actually saying is that this is a case where an environmental impact uh, was reached not merely by saying that you're going to use less steel, but by saying that you're going to produce steel better. And that is the point of what we're going to discuss today, do how to do things better rather than do less things. Second thing about the Elcos project, there's an aspect that I'm not really going to be discussing over the next hour is how can I change the manufacturing process for materials in order to reduce their environmental impact. The basic idea in the Elcos project is that when in steelworks you're reducing an iron oxide, so you need to use reducers. The classic reducers are coal, that's how blast furnaces work, but you could very well imagine uh, reduction of iron oxide with um, hydrogen or electrons, which are the most efficient uh, reducers. Why could iron oxide not be electrolyzed to uh, create um, iron and steel? But then, scientifically, it's possible, but then can it be done practically and is it economically viable? And everything that's been announced um, in Alcos for the reduction of the impact in terms of uh, greenhouse gases are solutions which, of course, are more costly, meaning that these solutions only make sense from an industrial point of view, as well, of course, uh, from a technological and scientific point of view. They only make sense if the cost of the ton of CO2 is taken into account. They are all a uh, borderline uh, if uh, CO2 um, is at a cost of around 40 euros a tonne. When these projects were initiated, 
Um, one considered CO2 was 100 euros a tonne, and the current cost is 7 euros a tonne. So, if you think that you can ask an industrialist to produce steel and lose money with every tonne of steel they produce, it's pretty unrealistic. What I'm just trying to tell you is that there's um, a big difference between what is possible and feasible scientifically. Uh, for instance, what you could do is take the gas from the blast furnace, which contains CO and CO2, and reprocess it for the CO to re-reduce um, iron ore. And that's uh, technically possible. Um, but the big question is, is it viable from an economic point of view? And this uh, viability, of course, interfaces with political decisions, which are, um, am I going to uh, tax the production of CO2 um, just in Europe and not in China, and so on and so forth. So it shows how complex the project is. I'm not going to tell you about every aspect of the problem, but just um, by turning to current affairs, we can see how complicated it is. As you will have understood from the course as a whole, um, um, in fact, we're actually going to try and examine what we can do for 96% of the world's materials. If I look at CO2 emissions now, you have annual emissions here per tonne, and you have pretty much the same situation. Around 20% of the CO2 is uh, linked to these products. Why am I uh, focusing on CO2? It's not the only greenhouse gas, and it's not uh, the only uh, emission that has an environmental impact, but it's the one which globally is the most standardized or the most identified as being a major problem. So it's actually the driving force behind uh, impact limitation. So that uh, concerns the uh, menu of materials as such. Uh, how much of the materials do we produce? How much uh, greenhouse gases do they produce? How much energy do we consume to produce them? I haven't really told you about reserves yet. Uh, the reason is that the concept of reserves is um, um, comes with doubts. You know, reserves is the amount of material present on the Earth, although uh, we could probably imagine that we can go and mine other planets. But the notion of reserve is very much uh, coupled with the economic aspect. There are things that cannot be counted as reserves, but which become reserves once they become accessible. Um, look at um, uh, bituminous sands in Canada. No one ever thought that uh, they uh, could be mined, but if you do it at a cost, the reserves are equivalent to the oil in the subsoil of Saudi Arabia. So I won't talk about reserves because, or at least I'll only discuss them when we start to uh, touch uh, the uh, bottom of things. So let's have a look at um, reserves uh, really very, uh, very, very basically. Um, a couple of evolutions that may happen over time. If you take um, tin, and silver. Tin and silver are materials that are very much used for lead-free solders. Um, it's not that um, there isn't enough lead, but lead has been identified as having a, a pretty unpleasant environmental effect, and it's also not very good for people's health. So we want to have lead-free solders, and we think that we can use tin. The problem is that the amount of tin on Earth is finite. So we may end up in a situation where a solution, uh, a, an environmental and health requirement, may uh, uh, actually be limited by the availability of the material. Second aspect. We could think about uh, critical metals. There's a very good uh, OPEX. Um, a study, a report about rare metals. If you look at rare metals in terms of how rare they are and how important they are from an economic point of view, and this kind of thing 
um, allows you uh, to find out things. There are some metals uh, that are strategic and that are a problem. Some metals are very rare, but it's not a problem. If we take uh, another issue, it's the rare earths metals, um, which are strategic. They are con uh, considerable importance, uh, especially in manufacturing magnets and in problems of energy storage, batteries, and so on. Um, these materials are very, very important because, well, they're actually not that rare, but there aren't that many places where they can be found. And they're not so lucky. Uh, one of the places where there are a lot is China. And if there's one place where we really want to make batteries and engines, it's China too. So it's a situation where you think, oh, shucks, I can't really tell them not to make magnets. Uh, even if I do tell them, they will anyway. But uh, in any case, um, if they start making lots of magnets, it'll be difficult for us to do. So it's a situation where it's both a geopolitical argument, econo uh, technical and an economical constraint. If we look at the field of application of rare earths, around 13% are used in the automotive industry, 16% uh, in batteries, magnets, uh, chemistry. It's actually quite a, uh, a large portion of our industry, uh, plus all, all of these uh, trendy things that uh, spin in the air, uh, wind farms and so on. Um, you need magnets for those. So you have these rare earths, you need rare earths. The place where you can find it find them is uh, precisely a place where other people need them, what can you do? And that is eventually going to bring us to a very simple notion. It's um, obviously we don't, we, there's the urban uh, mine, mining, uh, meaning the rare earths that we've used already. So in addition to this material, <clears throat> between uh, materials encountered by chance and made to measure materials, there's also the whole idea of uh, using materials, but also of being suppliers of materials, of using the objects that one has already manufactured, um, where they become not only products, but also materials resources through recycling. And that's going to uh, be done more systematically. So if we no longer focus on the resources, but on the usages, let me show you a very iconoclastic um, way. This is uh, Mike Ashby's way um, of doing so. Um, as usual, things are much more complicated than they look, and they allows you to tr structure your chain of thought to try and understand what the big data is here. So in the same way as choosing between steel polymer or aluminium alloy for a particular structural uh, thing, uh, you don't need to know the entire uh, deformation curve. You just need to know uh, basically uh, the... Uh, uh, attraction limits and so on, ductility, and when you're designing the part, you need very precise information. In fact, what we're going to be doing here is the equivalent of the environmental impact, but a kind of degraded, um, no, not eco audits, what are they called? Um, so degraded that I've forgotten its name. Oh, right, a degraded version of the life cycle analysis. So we're not going to have a life cycle analysis in detail, but we're going to have a look at something much more simple than that, but that's going to allow us to compare us um, situations, solutions that we can can be taken into consider consideration. Um, in the same way as materials choice doesn't allow you to have part dimensioning, but it gives you quite a simple comparison between the various uh, potential options. So the product life cycle, we have natural resources, we produce materials, um, we need to transport the natural resources, we need to provide energy, uh, we need to add other materials, uh, to say to move from the ore to the material, and a certain amount of waste is going to be generated. So once you've gone from a material to, uh, from resource to material, you then have manufacturing, which is also going to require uh, transportation, um, additional products, and energy. And then to pass from the product um, all the way to um, obtain a manufactured product. And that's going to create waste, um, uh, machining waste, for instance. And then what about the use of the product? 
when using the product, take a car. A car uses up petrol, so there's going to be a fuel consumption, energy consumption. It's going to produce some nasty things, such as uh, exhaust fumes. And then based on the function of the product, what is the impact that it's going to have in terms of energy and uh, matter consumption? Which means that there isn't much sense when you're talking about the environmental impact of steel or of a polymer. You need to um, examine that in a given field. In the automotive industry, for instance, how much are you going to save in terms of petrol consumption? And how much is it going to cost in terms of energy consumption to produce the material? So, um, ultimately, this life cycle analysis means uh, uh, needs to examine a given product in a given sector. It doesn't mean that the materials are important and not important. It means that they're only one part of the problem. So you have your industrial product, which you've used, then you're reaching the end of life of the industrial product. You can either send it directly uh, to landfill. Um, it's less and less the case. You can produce energy from it by burning it after uh, crushing it. You can also recycle it. Um, the uh, manufacturing product can then be the material can be put back into the cycle, which is not um, neutral, because if you do it at the end of life of a product that has not been desi designed to be recycled, uh, tungsten is easy to recycle if you just have a block of tungsten. If you take tungsten and make little uh, filaments in light bulbs, you're going to see that there's a problem in separation. So when you're eco-designing a product, you also need to take into account the um, an endless amount of other uh, issues that are not purely engineering. So recycling is an option. Another thing that can be done is how you can actually repair the product. Um, when I was a kid, every year, uh, we I used to take my satchel um, to uh, uh, the shoemaker and I used to stitch uh, whatever was unstitched. And uh, now people just chuck things away. Uh, maybe that will be another way of uh, having smarter aspects. But then I'm not making friends when I'm saying this. Obviously, if someone here is in marketing, I'm sure that he won't be very happy uh, to hear me uh, say that you can just repair a product and use it for longer. So all of these questions, you you mustn't um, you must avoid being a too uh, wishy-washy and angelic. Um, the problems are not simple. There are many aspects that need to be taken into account, uh, not to mention uh, regulatory uh, issues. So now, once I have this kind of helicopter view of the issue, it becomes very nightmarish if you want to do it with every source of energy, every material, every product, um, every emission uh, produced by uh, manufacturing or use of the industrial product. That's the basic principle of the life cycle analysis on principle, uh, from cradle to grave. Although, uh, in fact, uh, you can actually resurrect from the grave through recycling. So that's typically the kind of thing uh, that you can obtain in the life cycle uh, assessment here for a drinks can. Uh, how much bauxite are you making? Are you mining? Um, how much electricity or oil uh, that you're going to use to make them. Then you have the amount of water, CO2 emissions, CO emissions, NO2, SO2. A very complex picture, which in fact is the analysis of a product that's already been made. Unfortunately, you will see that the methods that exist currently, uh, which are actually uh, more simple, are based on um, objects that have already been made. Uh, what is lacking is uh, the same type of analysis for objects that could be made. But of course, we're supposed to be telling you about science in the making, and these are precisely methods in the making. So um, if you look at resource, you have aspects of resource consumption, emissions, 
and the impact assessment, the impact of such emissions on the environment. Obviously, you need to uh, be very wary with these figures because, of course, you can imagine how much CO2 you produce. You can calculate that. You know that the way uh, that has an impact on uh, the environment is uh, uh, pretty much um, discussed. So I'm not saying that you can't have a full life cycle assessment, but what I am saying is that it's very expensive, um, needs to factor in a lot of details. It's something you can do for a given product, but it also means that it's something you can do um, uh, for a product you're trying to market in order to uh, try to have an influence on regulations um, in order to have a, a matched market. So I'm not actually trying to sell anything today, but I'm trying to find out how we can have a simplified version of the life cycle assessment that could be used um, in the initial phases of design and not for someone in marketing who wants to um, uh, sell it to you uh, at the end of the production cycle. So the whole idea behind this is essentially um, there are two major things that you're going to be examining, CO2 emissions and the energy content. And that is what we're going to be using um, to assess the different versions of an industrial product. So we choose the energy source and we choose the source of emission. And this is going to require this is going to be based on the uh, origin of the energy. I'm going to tell you the amount of energy that's required to make an aluminium can, and then you're going to be wondering how much CO2 that's going to emit. Um, it's very different, of course, if you assess that in Australia, where essentially electricity comes from coal, or in France, where essentially all of the uh, electricity comes electricity comes from nuclear power and so there's always a local aspect that needs to be factored in second very important point um, in this diagram you need to make a distinction between the various phases in uh, a product's life so which brings you from the catalog of structure to say in these different phases of a product's life, what are the dominant phases? And it won't be the same thing for a car, for a house, or for an airplane. So you need to know in the phases of a product's life, in terms of energy or CO2 emissions, what comes from the material itself, what comes from the um, a production, what comes from transport, what comes from use, and then what comes from disposal um, when there is at the end of life of the product, either uh, disposal or recycling, recovery. So for the two indicators, energy and emissions of CO2, you really need to know which phase of the product's life you're talking about and which phase um, has the highest impact. So if I look at the data here, um, obviously we have data about materials, we need data about the amount of energy uh, stored, consumed, and we need to examine the emissions that you can relate to the production of a ton of material. So this is the energy consumption um, um, plotted here on this chart. See if you have metal uh, alloys in megajoules per kilo, titanium obviously wins. Magnesium is interesting because if you say that you want to replace the uh, pedal um, of uh, a car, the, the sort of speed pedal, obviously you're going to gain weight if you uh, replace it with magnesium because it's much lighter. So in terms of the car's use, the car is going to be lighter and it's going to use consume less petrol uh, per mile. But magnesium, the amount of energy that you need to consume to produce it is very high. And in order to produce magnesium, uh, you need to do that um, you in the process you end up with sort of fluoride and other unpleasant products. So if you want to uh, consider things rationally, you need to think what's important in the car? Is it what I put in the car or is it the use of the car throughout its lifetime? It all sounds very simple of course, but 
if you start looking at things, uh, there are certain uh, there's a lot of baloney that can be uh, deflated, as it were. Uh, there was a project a few years back. Uh, I won't name any names. It was those, you know, those lovely little cars that uh, consume. Uh, they're very pretty. They consume l lots of petrol, but they said it was a fantastic project to uh, have a dashboard that was environmentally friendly. Wow. Sure, you had an environmentally friendly dashboard, but it was point uh, zero 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 one percent of the uh, car's um, environmental impact. So it was really taking people, um, uh, thinking people were stupid. So you really need to identify where the highest impact is. So if you now look at um, the various aspects of the use of materials uh, in terms of sustainable development. I'd like to show you several aspects of the problem. Why do we actually need to ask the question? We need to ask the question uh, when manufacturing the industrial product. We need to ask the question um, in terms of damage to the environment. We need to change the manner in which we use the materials, um, especially in terms of the reuse of the materials or recycling of uh, what is in them. And we need tools um, uh, to show which the dominant terms are. So it's a great challenge for industry because consumers are increasingly aware of these ideas. Um, it's also a source of development uh, for industrial uh, sectors. We'll see a certain number of cases here in the example uh, given by Bernard Hiriex. Uh, there are plenty of things that you can do uh, to be nice with little birdies, and it can actually create wealth and growth. And if you look at the positive aspect of things, it can also be a way to reduce the waste of materials by reducing um, the amount of uh, water, energy, and so on that you're going to use. And you can say that uh, emissions and um, waste, um, rubbish, and so on, um, you can actually work in much more of a closed loop with the materials. So that is what is called eco-efficiency. It's not a very recent concept, but the first time that it was really um, uh, named explicitly um, was in a report by Phillips saying that delivering competitively priced goods and services that satisfy human needs and enhance quality of life while reducing the ecological impact and use of resources. Um, every word was weighted very, very carefully. The products need to be competitive. Um, if no one obviously buys the product, there's no point. It needs to satisfy needs. It needs to improve quality of life, whatever your definition of improving quality of life may be. Um, while reducing the ecological impact, destruction of the environmental of the environment and use of resources, so it's really an active approach. It's of building something new. It's not um, let's just stop it all and go to bed. So why one why should one have a systemic approach? Because it's a question of industrial product and not just of materials, but it is a question of materials, shape, and process. And there's a whole set of questions that you need to ask in materials choice. Um, I think to oversimplify, when you're talking about a car's environmental impact, there's already the shape of the car, whether it's aerodynamic or not, or whether the materials, um, if there's anything else than tons of uh, steel in your car or not. So the industrial process uses up materials um, in its operation and all the way to its end of, li end of life, and each of these steps uses up energy. So strategies for sustainable development, um, there are quite a few. There's optimizing the efficiency, 
um, more miles, more uh, miles to the gallon. You can optimize. In fact, that could mean you have a more efficient engine. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, changing uh, bits of the car. Um, optimizing materials and process choice to minimize the environmental impact. Um, if you have a gas flow, for instance, burning in a porous material, and in the sense that it would sort of heat up this porous material, uh, became, and through the uh, radiation, you had a kind of radiator. Uh, how can you do that most efficiently? How can you use the gas most efficiently? Uh, which is the um, material that you can use that has the lowest impact on the environment? And what is their impact of, uh, on the environment in terms of, um, of uh, emissions? So choice of materials and choice of process are crucial. crucial in the design process. And then, of course, the design needs also to favor recycling. So um, quite an old example. When the uh, steel, waste, metal started to be recycled from a car, you take a car, uh, you crush it, it makes a pretty sculpture, and then you say, I'll just chuck all of that into an electric oven and um, recover the steel. And when people started to do that, uh, what happened is that you started to make crocodiles, and you'd have because you have um, um, a plate steel that would open up like a crocodile's mouth, because there was there were so many electrical, um, there was so much copper in all of this electrical wiring. Um, you had a copper, a steel with copper in it, and the copper would melt before the steel there would be a fragilization with these metals and you'd end up with a steel that was intrinsically fragile at lamination temperature because there was copper in it from um, recycling. So you can imagine this factory with this kind of, it's really called crocodiling, it's very spectacular. Um, uh, people actually aren't very usually very happy when they see that happening in a factory. But um, So what do you do? You say, I stop recycling the steel from the car? What you can say is that you can recycle the waste steel as long as you have designed the cars in a way um, that you can actually remove um, a, a kind of huge spider which you can sort of rip out um, in one go, uh, remove all the copper. Copper is also a good thing to recycle and then you can recycle the steel. So. Just to tell you that the question of recycling is also something that needs to, um, that has effects on the entire design of a product. Also, uh, design of the assembly, for instance. If um, disassembly of the various materials needs to be facilitated, you need uh, from the onset to think when assembling these various materials how they can then be disassembled at the end of life. So, you're going to end up in a situation where, in fact, no one knows everything. So people in processes, materials and design need to work together. So one aspect that's very important in all of this is uh, how things can last longer. You can try to increase the lifespan of the product. You can try to favor its mendability. Uh, you can try to avoid undue replacements, all of this. Uh, sounds like a perfect world, of course, because uh, people who are going to say that's uh, no-go are people from marketing, because people from marketing uh, want you to want to buy stuff and uh, uh, chuck it out and buy new stuff. So this only moves forward if it has mass support, either uh, from uh, consumers or from the regulator. I tend to think that actually if consumers become more aware of this, it'll work better. So what's the potential for action? You can um, have an effect on materials properties, on energy content, on renewable resources. In terms of processes, um, the you can have an impact on energy consumption and the environmental impact, and in design on the uh, efficiency of the design itself. So the types of evaluations that exist for industrial products, you can uh, obviously assess their weight. Um, that's very true uh, with objects that need to be moved around. There's not just transport, but there's also um, something that moves in a motor.
So you have the question of weight. You have the question of、uh, hazardous substances that are used or produced. There's the question of packaging. If you look in the general public, the amount of stuff that is used to package things is huge, and the environmental impact is very interesting. What do you do with glass? Do you recycle it, or、uh, do you have returnable bottles? It's、um, economic and technical. What do you do、um, in for the production and use of energy? What do you do for recycling? And within all of these issues, of course, the materials play a key role. What I was just trying to say、uh, was that, of course, usually when you have a situation, a directive is published,、um, usually not、uh, fully understandable. But there is a European directive that says that they must say that they have taken into consideration. Uh, the use of energy in their products as it relates to materials, manufacture, packaging, and transport use and end of life. Once you've said that they need to have uh, considered, um, that doesn't say very much, does it? Let me return to this、uh, life cycle analysis,、um, this little diagram we saw before, and try to look at it、um, in a little bit more detail. What are we going to try to do here? Um, I think this is where the research stands currently.、Um, in Cambridge, for instance,、uh, what you can do is have a kind of eco audit to examine various industrial products or various or a given implementation of a product,、uh, which part of the CO2 comes from the various phases in its life cycle.、Uh, there are implications in design. If there's a non-negligible part that comes from materials, you need to see how you can minimise the amount of material,、uh, but not only、uh, the amount, but the amount of material multiplied by the、uh, amount of CO2 per ton. If you notice that the place where it's important is the manufacturing phase, well, you need to try and minimise、uh, process energy. Um, in the course of the process, it's dissipation. If it's transport,、um, obviously the obvious solution is to make lighter stuff, or、uh, to make stuff in a place where you won't need to be transporting a lot to where it's going to be used. So either minimise the cost of transport or minimise the amount of kilometres between、uh, production and use. And that's obviously very much an issue in construction. Uh, a bit less in other sectors, but、uh, if it's use,、um, it's obviously where are you losing energy,、uh, where are you emitting. If it's a car, it's clearly going to be the amount of、uh, fuel that the car is going to consume.、Um, so therefore, it's the car's、uh, mass. If it's construction, it's the amount of energy you're going to use to heat the building that you need to minimise. Hence, the idea of insulation. And、uh, of course, recycling,、uh, disposal. So you need to use non-toxic materials, recyclable materials, and you need to design the product in a way、uh, that can, it can be disassembled without great difficulty. This is something that I showed you in the inaugural lecture. It's、uh, the environmental impact of products in various fields of industry. Very clearly, it shows you、um, what you can do. If you look at an aircraft,、um, its lifespan is around 30 years. The amount of energy that's used is essentially through the aircraft's use. So, if your uh, uh, fibrous reinforcement polymer has an energy content that is greater than aluminium alloy,、uh, that it could be replaced with,、um, makes absolutely no sense. You can do it, of course. And people are using it as a sales argument, but in terms of environmental impact, it doesn't make any sense. But if you say, "Do I have structures that allow me to make the aircraft lighter?"、Uh, if I it becomes lighter by 500 kilos, I can have some an, an additional passenger. That starts to make sense. If you take the other extreme,、uh, you take a car park. Essentially. In terms of impact and energy, it's the material that you're going to use to make a covered car park.、Uh, 
that's going to be a problem. You're actually not going to heat your car park unless perhaps you're in Canada. Uh, if you have a house, um, you have a comparable spread of the energy use uh, between the production of the car, of the house, I beg your pardon, and the use of the house uh, because you're heating it and using electricity in it. So uh, very quickly, you see that the notion of lifespan uh, is very important because you need to take of course, uh, the flow of the use of energy and production of CO2, and you need to compare it with an initial entry point. But it only makes sense if you know how long you're going to be using the product for. Um, it's very interesting for wind turbines, for instance, uh, because you can reasonably say, um, am I going to be saving more CO2 with this wind turbine than I produced than I generated by in manufacturing it. And these questions are no longer sort of I like, I do not like. And th this kind of analysis is probably the first big question that you need to ask in terms of eco-design. So the software that's being developed in Cambridge allows you to perform this kind of analysis. Um, and the good thing about it is that it's coupled with a materials database of uh, the same as the one I showed you initially, and contains information about the environmental impact of materials. So here I say caveat. Um, it's uh, the best in kind information, but it's not necessarily uh, totally reliable. So it's not always easy to assess the environmental impact in terms of CO2 for a given material. Uh, people don't necessarily agree. But at least if you have a methodology methodology that's um, healthy is better than having, than having an unhealthy one with uh, non-existent data. If I take a lamp uh, like this, for instance, what I need to know if I want to eco-audit it, um, what are the materials I'm using, what are the processes, what are the needs in terms of transport, what is the um, life cycle and what happens uh, during its end of life. So this is going to yield some data about other materials but also their environmental properties. What are the energies involved, process energies, and obviously the data is more reliable for materials and for processes with this type of tool. This results in a kind of eco-audit model, which is going to yield this kind of diagram. And then um, there's a kind of summary in which uh, we're going to find the uh, consumption in terms of materials, energy, emission uh, for the various phases of the product. So this is something that's, uh, Um, in fact, you it's you don't start from I want to make an electric lamp, um, do what you can. Um, basically, what you need to do is analyze the different options. So, I mean, what's the difference compared to a, li a usual life cycle analysis? What changes is that this is very simple, and that you can uh, do this in the initial phases of uh, design in order to have comparisons, which can then be confirmed or not by a much more detailed life cycle analysis. One example of this is the example of packaging for uh, a drink. Um, because you can take a fizzy drink, it can be packaged in glass, in plastic, in aluminium, in steel, and uh, you might want to know what the environmental impact of the various options is. So let's have a few case studies to illustrate all of this before we um, uh, then produce, uh, go to the drinks can. Um, this is quite a fun one. Um, what are things that look very similar? It's the um, bumper on the car or the security rail on the uh, roadside. Um, one uh, carries people and the security rail uh, does not, but basically they do the same thing, um, and usually they come into contact. So 
so it, it, there are static barriers and mobile barriers, and let's try and analyze the impact. So the function is to absorb impact, to transmit load uh, to energy absorbing units and so on. And if you're in a dominant phase, of course, you don't really transport it. Um, it doesn't move, so it's the production that consumes energy. Um, the bumper on the car um, consumes energy in its use. So the criterion is on the left, the bending strength per unit of uh, embodied energy. And on the other one, it's the bending strength per unit mass. In one case, you're trying to reduce the mass of the car. In the other case, you're trying to reduce the amount of energy. So if you look at a performance index, you have the elasticity limit at the power of two thirds divided by the amount of energy and material density. And here you have the elasticity limit at the power of two thirds divided by density. Very simple. It's the performance index that takes into account, or not, the energy content. Now, if you put that on a selection card, selection map, you see that if you have a contour in terms of uh, the amount of energy with that uh, performance index, very naturally you can have uh, low carbon steels, you can have low alloy steels, uh, modular graphites, or um, a grey cast iron. So if you say that it's not, uh, if you need to have ductility too because you want to absorb energy, you're going to end up in a result in a situation where you're going to be looking more towards carbon steels or low alloy steels. If uh, if you're thinking about the car bumper, you will see that the question is absolutely not the same. If you look at the same database, you can see the parallel lines are equi performance. Um, uh, lines along the same line they have equal performance and here you see that if you just want the lighter material you can have magnesium alloys, aluminium alloys, titanium alloys or even uh, reinforced uh, polymers with carbon fiber are very high performance and if you layer um, the fact that you need to have something that's acceptable in terms of um, of cost, uh, you're not going to make carbon fiber composite, but you can use uh, reinforced uh, polymers, uh, reinforced by particles and not composites. They won't absorb that much energy, so you're going to need to use crash boxes behind that uh, effectively, which brings you back to the entire redesign. Uh, but typically, uh, you have technical specs here, either transporting or not transporting, and it's actually going to uh, give you a whole a different set of criteria for your materials choice. Let's have a look at the bottle of water. Um, these are various options. You have glass, polyethylene, uh, aluminium or steel. Let's have a look at the CO2 impact and the energy impact. What we're going to try to do now is take an example say, okay, I'm going to make 100. This is in fact exactly what you need to carry out a quick eco audit. So you have a PT bottle with a polypropylene cap. It's a blow molded. What's in, in French? I've got a polymerist blow molded. Okay, injection soufflage in French. So it's filled in France. Um, uh, it uh, transports 550 uh, km to the UK. It's refrigerated for two days, then drunk. So if it's made in France and drunk in France, it's not going to be the same effect, of course. If you need to store it in the fridge for two weeks before you sell it, the amount of energy used to refrigerate isn't going to be the same. So you're going to have information um, that you can input through a questionnaire. So take a material such as PET. You have blow molding, mass 0 0.04 kilograms, end of life recycled. You take the caps, uh, polypropylene and so on. And then you can input the information about transport. Is it 
um, on uh, carried on a ship, on a train, on a truck, for how long, uh, how long is it going to be refrigerated for. And when you do that, if I go directly to the energy of use, If you get the final step, which is recycling, if you look at the various uh, uh, proportion uh, that is recycled, and you go directly to the result, if you have your result both with the information you've used from the user point of view, the database on materials property, the amount of energy, the uh, uh, CO2, CO2 footprint, the database about the processes, um, which you're going to be examining for the various products, what are the environmental impacts and so on, and you're going to obtain a result with four uh, pet bottles. So there's the pet bottle. Essentially the energy is consumed in production, not very much in the process, not so much in transport, a little bit more in refrigeration. And a tiny bit from a cap, from the cap. There's not much product in the cap, of course. If you look at it in terms of CO2 emissions or energy emissions, uh, depending on whether or not you recycle it, these are going to be the impacts, the different impacts of this uh, PET bottle. And then you can do exactly the same thing for the steel can, the aluminium can, the glass bottle. And ultimately, you can then compare are the various solutions. So uh, it brings me to the various uh, things. The function is to contain a fluid. Uh, the dominant uh, phase is the material. The criterion is the embodied energy per unit volume fluid contained. The amount of energy uh, per uh, for energy uh, used. It's um, functional, not material. And you obtain the energy per liter um, in the various uh, with the various options. If you look at the various options, steel wins over all the others. Uh, steel wins in the particular configuration I gave. If you change the criterion of saying is it manufactured here and consumed here, um, does it need to be refrigerated for long or not? Um, there are going to be variations that may change. So what this says is that between glass and polyethylene, uh, there's a big difference between P and PET. It's better to use PE between aluminium and steel. Well, it's better to use steel rather than aluminium. So if you had 9 and 9.2, uh, in fact, the precision of the analysis wouldn't be um, sufficient. But when you're between 3 and 9, you can say, however, um, it, it may not be very precise, but it is giving me at least an idea of the amount of energy uh, per litre of liquid. Um, it's obviously not the same thing. You need to do the same thing. Um, you need also to calculate CO2 emissions. And uh, you need to see uh, which is um, a priority. And then you need to look at the price. And then, of course, there's the whole issue of how much you're prepared to pay to consume less energy or emit less CO2. So the main points, the main um, takeaways are that it's a product issue here, not a simple materials problem. In a given environment, there's the location where you produce it and the location where you use it. Uh, materials choice is a key aspect. I'm not saying that you must not have a detailed life cycle analysis, but um, having a clearer materials choice um, allows you to identify the dominant terms. And then when you have a performance index analysis, allowing you to clarify the benefits of a given material, um, in fact, in order to design the part, you need to go into the detailed information about the material you intend to use. Which brings me to the end of the lecture. I gave you this little compliment. I would just like to return briefly to um, this uh, radiant burner. Uh, how can you have design a made-to-measure material for a radiant burner? Um, 
there are a certain number of solutions which in terms of uh, NOx and CO emissions were different. I showed you that uh, for a given power, it was better uh, here to use a, a Fikrali to reduce that. And now if you look at the uh, radiation power, it would seem that the ceramic solutions are better. Uh, not necessary very significantly, but a little bit better. Or at least, anyway, much better than this type of ceramics. And then what really counts? Is it uh, the efficiency of the gas use, or is it um, the emissions of CO or NOx? And this becomes highly unpleasant for uh, people, is that both, in fact, have an environmental impact. So uh, both emitting uh, less pollutants and being more energy efficient. Uh, not even, notwithstanding the cost, there are two environmental impacts. Which, which one of these environmental impacts is the most important? And I think we need, in the coming years, to assess the environmental impact, not from a sentimental point of view, but from a rigorous estimate um, with quite a high degree of precision. Um, or actually even quite a low one um, initially, and then a more advanced uh, comparison about the Im impacts of various choices. So I was just telling you about the recycling of materials. Uh, one of the things that returns when you're discussing the environmental impact, again, I think you need to be wary of ideas that look good on paper. Precisely, if you look at recycling paper. Who in this room would say that it's not a good idea to recycle paper? But the problem is, it, um, if you do that, one of the consequences is that there are more forest fires, uh, because recycled paper is not that good quality, and is actually replacing the a paper that's produced with uh, wood from the undergrowth. If you uh, do not have systems to pick up um, little twigs and everything in forests that are no longer picked up um, unless you used to use them to burn them, the result is that you're not going to be maintaining your forests and you're going to be increasing the occurrence of forest fires. So I don't think any friend of nature is going to say that forest fires are a good idea. I'm not saying that you shouldn't recycle paper. I'm trying to say that you need to be very, very wary of uh, ideas that seem to be obvious good ideas. If you want to recycle paper, you also need to find a solution uh, that's economically viable uh, to handle um, uh, little twigs and so on. Maybe that means you need to work on developing wood burners, wood boilers. Uh, so in a sense, I'm also um, shooting myself in the foot because I said that to create high-performance materials, innovative, uh, to uh, address uh, innovative specifications, everything, we're moving towards ideas of made-to-measure hybrid materials, except when you start making these sorts of materials, um, you're also thinking in terms of assembly, and then things get very complicated in terms of recycling and recovery. So in terms of the environmental impact, having what I call architectured materials is something that also needs to be done, that also needs to factor in how architectured materials can be recovered. So my conclusions. Eco-design for sustainable development is a problem for engineers. It's an engineering problem. Um, there are a lot of things that are not merely technical. There's um, the uh, economic aspect, sociological aspect, but it is not a religious belief. Recycling is not always good for the environment. It can be, but not systematically. I think you know what I'm saying here. Uh, the ways that people talk about the most are not usually the most problematic. Um, the most criticized source of energy are not necessarily the most damaging for the environment, and regulations can be stupid. A very good example. Uh, a few years back, Denmark, in an age when people were starting to discuss the environmental impact, they had a look 
at whether it was better to use steel, aluminium or polymers. Uh, that was stupid, because the question was about the material and not the product. Second stupid idea, uh, they said they were going to ask the steel industry what they thought about aluminium, and the people in the aluminium industry what they thought about steel. Steel, uh, people said aluminium was rubbish, and uh, vice versa. So the regulation that came out, and they said that for environmental impacts and sustainable development, it was much better to use polymers. So obviously the polymer specialists were really happy, but the way in which the, the, they reached the conclusions was a bit um, uh, suspicious, to say the least. So the use of materials in sustainable development is not straightforward. The driving forces of the market are naturally opposed meaning that only regulations and uh, active consumer awareness can counteract these forces. And I would end by saying that um, I just wanted to show you two diagrams. I'm not going to discuss them at any length in this course, but I think you need to um, have them in mind. Uh, we're discussing technological innovation. You can see how new requirements result in new innovative solutions in the field of materials. I told you essentially about the right-hand side of the diagram, what I call the product physiology, the design, uh, the materials that are used, what makes a product fulfill its industrial function. And then, on the other hand, there's uh, the psychological aspect of the product. It's a very interesting field of investigation, especially in terms of mass consumption products. It's the manner in which a product is perceived. Of course, there's ergonomics and aesthetics. Uh, some of you are going to go away on a ski holiday shortly, I'm sure. And I'm sure a lot of research in the skis is um, uh, to research um, how varnishes that are going to become scratched, but not in the shop, but after using them. They want the skis to become scratched on the piste so that you can buy new ones. So the aesthetic aspect is very important. Two, um, but I'll finish with the second diagram here. What I've been trying to show up until now, um, we, uh, we have uh, design, end of, end of life, and so on. We have looked at uh, how we could develop tailor-made materials. I've tried to show you the lower part here. How can I use the same type of process to assess the environmental impact? I have just briefly said that this particular branch here uh, is increasingly important in developing a product, and that this particular branch, I've decided I wasn't going to discuss it, but you saw that it came back again and again uh, through the examples I discussed. Which brings me to the conclusion of uh, today's lecture before we listen to Bernard Iriex. And the next lecture will um, be about what I can really demand from materials, the very worst case scenario. And sometimes we will see that it's not possible and really need to get our brains working. And now over to Bernard Iriex. Thank you very much.